Hi, I'm here today to talk to you about the classic quantum mechanics problem that we usually call particle in a box, or sometimes the infinite square well, and I threw in the word quantum there to remind you of the more general context, and the word or phrase 1D to remind you that this is the simplest and first case of such a problem. Now, I'm writing this for uh, the regular junior level quantum mechanics class that at my school is physics 460 uh, but i'm doing that as a review and i really expect if you're in that class that you've seen all of this before and that you know it pretty well from the prerequisite course which is the end of the intro sequence for physics majors in pretty much any program in the u.s here at dominguez hills that's called physics 134. Uh, if you don't feel like you know everything that i'm doing here today except maybe some little notational thing here and there. You need to review more. Uh, that said, uh, I don't necessarily think at the beginning of this class you remember everything and can do it on your own right away. So it, if you had to think in this, that, that's fine. But hopefully, by the middle of this class, you would be insulted by looking at this. I really feel that way. Uh, here's the problem, basically. Uh, pictorially here, I've got an x-coordinate and a potential that goes up to infinity at two walls and mathematically here potential zero inside infinite outside I start with Schrodinger's equation in the full time dependent form which you may not have started with in the previous course but you got there at some point uh, I remember that I can separate variables and make the time independent Schrodinger equation which is what I actually need to solve and the time piece, which has set solutions for a given energy. If you've forgotten about how that separation of variable works, uh, I've got a whole other video on that that I'll link to this video with a little uh, box in the corner there, so you can look at that if you want. Uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of the math that you might have seen, but I'm going to talk about that problem and then apply it. Now, the coordinate there, I went from 0 to A. I hope you know it doesn't really matter whether, first of all, I call that A or L or whatever. But also, I could have called it 2A, or I could have put the origin in the middle or, or whatever I want. Some books, in fact, do uh, put the origin in the middle of the well. And when they do that, they occasionally call the width 2A or 2L or 2 of their letter of choice for a length. Uh, I followed the convention that suits what I'm doing today, but also is consistent with the book we've been using most recently in our class. Uh, there's some advantage, actually, to putting the origin in the center. It makes it easier to address certain symmetry arguments, but I'm not going to use those today. Uh, having the left edge on the origin makes the form of solutions the same. Frankly, you know the answers here. They're all sinusoidal waves. And when I put it on the edge, they're all sines, no cosines. Uh, having the width 2a, if you put the center on the origin, uh, makes it look a little cleaner because some fractions are avoided. Uh, having the width be the real physical width uh, lets you connect the physical problem to the mathematical answer a little better, I think. Not a big deal. Uh, you know how to do these problems. First, you note that outside, that is when x is less than zero or greater than a the spatial wave function has to be zero because the potential is infinite continuity of the wave function means that the inside that is between zero and a wave function has to vanish at the walls if you've forgotten about why continuity should be that way got another whole video on that i will link it to this video the potential inside is zero so the solutions inside look just like plane wave solutions sinusoidal uh, the boundary conditions when I'm at either wall x equals 0 or x equals a mean that this, the sinusoidal functions that are allowed are the ones that vanish at those points so that gives me the allowed wavelengths thus the allowed wave number thus the energy quantization in the end if you're writing a wave function make sure to normalize it uh, the solutions are these particular sine waves. All of them have the same normalization factor, 
root 2 over a. All of them are sines, as I mentioned before, and there's either uh, a half a wave that is just pi, or two halves, or three halves, or however many you want half waves inside that box. Thinking of this as sine kx means that k, the wave number, is n pi over a. And knowing the relationship of wave number to momentum, I can write the energy as n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2 ma squared. Uh, it's convenient for notational reasons to write omega as e over h bar. So I just pop an h bar out of that, and that gives me the time solution for the nth state e to the omega e to the i omega sub n times t. Okay. So that's when we put it all together, we multiply those wave functions. And I'm following the convention that most books follow, where if I use the non-capital, the minuscule Greek letter of psi, I mean the spatial wave function. If I use the capital letter, I mean the full wave function spatial times time. Uh, remember, you can always throw in a complex phase as long as it's modulus 1, that is an e to the i theta. And it won't affect anything in those states. However, if you make linear combinations, which is what we're going to do, then you're going to see explicit time dependence. And any relative complex phase will make a difference in that time dependence. You can calculate expectation for any operator on any state, including the ones we're going to look at, uh, with the bracket notation, which is something you may not have used much in a previous course, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's the operator sandwiched between that wave function and itself, which means an integral on all space, but the only place where it's not zero here is zero to a, of the complex conjugate of the wave function times the operator applied to the wave function, all integrated on dx. Don't forget to normalize that linear combination. Remember, if you're adding two states, you've got to divide by something to make it still normalized. It helps to think when you do these problems about orthogonality of states. That is, when I look at the integral on all space of two different solutions to that wave function, I get zero, but two of the same ones integrated on all space, I get one. That's this thing we call a Kronecker delta, which you should have seen. Uh, if you don't remember that, Come and talk to me if you're in my class or whoever, whoever's class you're in. Uh, in this case, remember sines and cosines, this case I mean these states, they have lots of shortcuts for definite integrals. I'm actually not going to do the integrals in front of you now. I'm going to defer to how they get done and what the answers are. And I'm going to walk through a couple, a couple examples. Uh, both toy examples I do are going to use the same fairly general state made out of the first two, psi 1, psi 2. But I'm just taking one of them and adding a complex phase multiple of the other, and I have to normalize it with a 1 over root 2. The first example I'm going to look at is the expectation value for x on that state. And to do it, I need that whole state. And remember, in this notation, the fact that it's on the left side with the so-called bra instead of ket means that it's a complex conjugate of the state. I have to explicitly put the complex conjugate of that factor there. So that's an e to the minus i theta on that side. The x operator is equal to the x coordinate, so that just appears in there. The half is the product of those two factors, 1 over root 2. I multiply that out the same way I would have done in pre-algebra in seventh grade, if I weren't scared of Greek letters, and I get this thing that's starting to look a little bit messy, but you're adults now, you can handle it. First thing to note, uh, before I start really doing integrals, I know the expectation value of x for any one of these pure states, this c1, c1, c2, c2. The expectation value is right in the middle. That is, it's at a over 2 for each of those. So those integrals I've actually done now in my head are based on physical grounds, whatever you want to call it. I've got an answer for those terms. 
uh, so I can combine them. That, that helps a lot. And what I have left here is two terms that look kind of similar, but shuffled around. In fact, notice uh, the 1 and 2 index get switched in the second of these terms. And that prefactor of e to the i theta becomes an e to the minus i theta in the second term. So those terms are complex conjugates of each other. When I add a number to its complex conjugate, I get twice the real part of that number. Okay. So that's what I've put in here. Uh, this becomes nearly doable already. Okay. This is what I have to solve. I have to find the real part of that thing in parentheses. Uh, the spatial factors, which are an integral, well, that those are all real factors. Those can come out front of the real part. And the real part applies only to the time terms and that complex phase. The real part of e to the i something is cosine of something. Still have this integral to do that's hanging around, but that's some numeric factor. So I already know a lot about what's going on here. I can calculate that by doing the integral. I could do it on paper, but frankly, I checked in Wolfram Alpha myself. Got this factor of 16 over 9 pi squared, which is about a sixth, by the way. Uh, I decided to draw this out for you just so you could take a look at it. Uh, if I look at the squared wave functions for a couple of extreme forms, uh, half minus a sixth is one third, and a half plus a sixth is two thirds. So basically, the expectation value oscillates back and forth between about one third and about two thirds which kind of makes sense when you think about it physically. I don't have time to stop and think about that, but you do. You can pause the video if you want. Uh, my second toy example is about the momentum expectation for the same state. So it starts as the same game. Do the same thing. It's a little more complicated because P is a more complicated operator. But now that first and last term are even easier. There are zero. The middle terms are, again, two things that look like they're just adding the complex conjugates of each other. I have to watch out just a little bit. Uh, that's the real part of what's inside there. Now, e to the i theta and this integral, again, the spatial parts can come out. But the spatial parts have a derivative, so it's not going to be as easy an integral. I still did it on paper before checking on the computer. The time part, well, the momentum operator has at least i h bar, and the i cannot come outside of the real part. That means I'm looking at not the cosine here, but the sine of what's in all that argument with a minus s i g n uh, because of the way this factor of i is there. So the minus and the h bar I've pulled out in front, the integral means I'm doing a derivative of that C2 before I integrate from 0 to A. Sinusoidal behavior, again, as expected. Um, when I do that integral, here's the answer I get. Uh, frankly, I think it's a little harder to get some physical intuition on this, uh, but you can look at the limiting cases and say, what do I know? Well, if there were no phase between these two, I would start with zero momentum because I'd start in a mixture of pure states, which actually works here. It's the way that math shakes out. Uh, you could plot a few things about that. It makes sense that the frequency, omega 2 minus omega 1, is the same as it was for position. It better be. Uh, it makes sense that this complex phase is going to give me a different starting value because after all, that's what phase is all about. You can do much more complicated problems than this with the same machinery. I just wanted to run through some quick examples for some things you should already know for the beginning of your quantum mechanics class. So I guess with that, I'll leave you to study for yourself and to go on further. Thanks. See you in class.